In this video, we're going to look at the central processing unit in a lot of detail. So it's really important that you pause in this video every so often, you're jotting down notes, you are um, you know, revisiting some of the different parts of the video because there's going to be quite a lot of information being thrown at you. Normally, I do this over quite a few lessons, but with me not having actual lesson tasks to do, it makes more sense for me to just go through the whole thing. So first, we're going to look at something called von Neumann architecture. So a computer scientist called John von Neumann, I think he's a mathematician, proposed that a program should be stored as a binary number program and so it can be modified as it was ran. And this is called the stored program concept. Okay, so the stored program concept is where the program instructions and the data for that program are stored in the same memory space and retrieved as necessary. So the program and the data used are stored in the same place, rather than the idea of a program being stored in one place and the data for that program stored somewhere else, so all together. So the role of the CPU is to execute program instructions one by one and in order. It then stores or acts on the results. This also involves sending signals to other components of the systems and interpreting and acting on responses as per a set of instructions. So don't ever write this in an exam, but the CPU is like the brain. Just like your brain sends signals to your arms and legs and it does all your thinking, that's what the CPU does. Now, some people have asked me in the past, well, is a CPU an input and output device? And it's not. So a computer takes in an input from like a keyboard or a mouse the CPU then gets a signal sent to it and processes that, does whatever it needs to do, whether it's um, sending a message to the output device to show the letter A on the screen. Or it might be that it's doing some maths and needs to save it in main memory or save it in secondary storage. So you've got the input, process, output model. So the central processing unit is made of lots of different components. In old computers, they would all be printed on separate circuit boards. However, all the um, main devices in a CPU are printed onto one circuit board. So if technically a CPU is a microprocessor, but the idea is instead of having loads of different circuit boards, you've got one circuit board, and I'm sure you've seen a CPU before, um, one circuit board that has all the different bits on it. So, the first component is the control unit or the CPU. Now the control unit is a little circuit inside the CPU that coordinates the activity of all other units. So, it fetches instructions, it decodes instructions, it tells the ALU, which we'll cover in a moment, what it needs to do, and it directs the flow of data between the CPU and other devices. So it's a little bit like the manager, it tells, keeps track of um, what's doing what, it knows what next instruction is to do, and it sort of keeps everything coordinated. The arithmetic logic unit, or ALU, is responsible for carrying out all the Boolean calculations and mathematical calculations and looking at um, Boolean expressions that result in true or false. So like, it's like a calculator, so if you were in 2 plus 2, the ALU would go and calculate that for you. As well as things like if you looked look at a program before, or if statements there are all calculated by the ALU. Now, memory is a really important component of a CPU because we need an intermediate access store. So what the CPU mainly uses is the RAM, the random access memory. This is a memory store that allows us to fetch and store data and program instructions. Now technically, the RAM we use nowadays is called DRAM or Dynamic Random Access Memory and that is where the instructions we're currently working on and the data are stored. However, RAM is not inside the CPU. It's used by the CPU, but it's not a part of the CPU. You can pull a RAM stick out of your computer and your computer will still work. The CPU just uses RAM. If you don't have RAM, the CPU will be able to run most things, but it's not an actual part of the CPU, they're two separate things. <clears throat> now, a register is a small bit of memory similar to RAM that can be found directly on the CPU. Now, some registers, have a specific role and others are just there to store some data but they're very very fast and use static RAM principles which makes them very expensive so it's a lot faster than RAM 
and it's also a lot closer because it's actually physically inside the CPU which makes it even faster. Now we've got a bunch of registers that you need to know about. We've got the MAR which is the memory address register which stores an address in memory that is to be accessed so when programs are stored in memory they're all given a memory address. The memory address register stores that address for what it's currently doing. You've got the memory data register for the MDR but maybe called the MBR but for the example being the MDR which stores the data or instruction that has been transmitted from main memory so that's the actual instruction or the number you store in. The program counter stores the address of the next instruction so if you're on instruction 3 the program counter will store instruction 4 so the number 4 in there. And you've got the CIR which is the current instruction register which stores the current instruction that's been carried out and the accumulator stores the last result of an ALU operation so if in the previous task or previous um, instruction you did 5 plus 5 the accumulator will still have 10 in it until you did another ALU operation. Now buses, they transfer, they transfer data around the computer. So a data bus is a two-way data bus which sends data between the processor, the memory unit and the input and output devices. So it'll send data to it and receive data. The address bus is one way which transport the, transports the address to be accessed in main memory. And the control bus is one way from the CPU to the components which sends special signals to the various components in the computer. So cache is a small memory store found on or very close to the CPU, which also uses static RAM. It is used to store instructions and data that are being used often. Storing them close to the CPU and by using static RAM speeds up the access time for the instructions and prevents the CPU having to wait too long. Now you might have seen when you've ever gone through a website or you've looked at a new AMD Ryzen CPU and you've seen it say it's 4 megabytes of L3 cache. That's what we're talking about here. So the more cache you've got, the more instructions can be stored locally on the CPU, which should speed things up. You've also got your different layers of the cache. So um, your different layers, air level, sorry, are different speeds. So you might have a CPU that's got um, one megabyte of level two cache and three megabytes of level three cache. Now, how I think of cache, it's a little bit like me marking books, so I could mark one book at a time and put it back on the pile and get another one. But it'd be a lot faster if I took the whole pile, marked every single book, and then put them back on the shelf. That'd be a lot faster for me to work because I'm walk going in between my filing cabinet and my desk. And that's how I think of as cache. So the more cache you've got, the faster your computer technically should run. Now your CPU has a thing called a clock, so the system clock helps synchronize various components of the system including the operations of the CPU itself. So a little bit like um, a pacemaker in your heart, if you've got higher trouble with your um, irregular beats you get a thing called a pacemaker. That sort of sends out electri electrical signals that sort of syncs your heartbeats. Now that's very similar in a CPU, so the clock's pulse acts as an enable signal now when the components get the signal, they can then do what they need to do. Now the speed of the clock is measured in either megahertz, so that's a megahertz is how many millions of instructions or cycles per second, or gigahertz, which is um, essentially a billion cycles per second, a thousand million. So your clock speed is a measure of how many operations a CPU can conduct in a second. The speed of the clock is measured in megahertz or gigahertz, like I've said. So you could ride your bike at a steady pace, or you can ride a bike really, really quickly. Now, the harder you work, the hotter you get, so you need to cool down. So if you've got a faster um, clock speed, you're going to need a better cooling system. You're also going to be using a lot more energy. So you're going to need a lot more electricity, so you need a bigger power supply. As well as if you're running really fast all the time, your chain on your bike and your wheels are going to get a lot more use out of them, which means they're going to probably break down a lot faster than if you was doing cycling at a leisurely pace. Which is why, if people overclock their CPUs too much or they're constantly using their CPU at max capacity, then it's not going to last as long as a casual user.
there's one thing I'm personally concerned about, the laptop I'm currently using isn't really meant for constant use, it's a Surface Pro, it's meant to be there for a little bit of light work, but I use mine pretty much every day to record videos, which generates a lot of heat, it pretty much puts my um, CPU at like 80% whilst I'm recording, which probably means it's not going to last as long as a better laptop would be able to, or if I was using this a bit more appropriately for my use. And then you've got the number of CPU cores. So the number of cores is how many physical cores a CPU has. So the more cores a CPU has, in theory, the more instructions it can do at once. So instructions can be uh, processed a lot faster. However, if one core is waiting for an instruction from another core to finish, it may be just as slow. So you've got a single core, which has one core, dual cores two, quad cores got four, you might have octa core, which has got eight cores, um, you know, we get, you can get some CPUs now that are saying that they can boast 16 cores. Now, that's all well and good. You do four things at once. Imagine having four brains and four sets of arms. It'd be great if you do loads of things at once. But say if this core needs this core and this core to finish, then it's just going to be sat around waiting in a queue. So it's just as slow just having a dual core processor and so on. Now, how the CPU actually goes ahead and carries out these instructions, it does the fetch decode execute cycle. So the CPU process instructions by using the FDE cycle. So it fetches instruction from memory, it is then decoded so the CPU understands what it needs to do, and then the CPU carries out the instruction. So when I talk about doing a million cycles per second in a megahertz, I'm talking about it does a million fetch decode execute cycles. So as I said before, make sure you're going back and you are revisiting some of the things I've spoken about, you're looking at the animations I've made, you're taking notes, and don't forget if it really helped, please subscribe, please like, and comment on any things you want me to cover or any improvements, any mistakes I've done, I'm sure it will happen because I'm not perfect, but I will see you in the next video.